Yeah, I, yeah. I think people's concern is that they don't know what does happen to horses. And then occasionally there is a welfare disaster and everybody blames the whole of racing for it. And I think that's why there needs to be a policy of a system in place to maintain the welfare of the horse throughout its life. That's not suggesting that we can feed and water every single race horse throughout its life, but there is somewhere for people to get education, help, and get advice when they get into trouble. And if there is a disaster, then there is a system to collect the vulnerable horses uh, and sort them out and rehome them. So we must have a system in place so when something goes wrong, we're seen to have done everything we possibly can to prevent it happening. But there will always be people who do things wrong. OK, thank you. Um, before David's question, we'll just do a Slido one from Anne Stevenson. Uh, should the UK follow our European neighbours, including Germany and France, in banning the removal of sensory whiskers from horses? Who should lead on this? A nice, charming subject. Actually, I mean, I would probably say banning things is the last thing to do, uh, because in many ways it just drives it underground. And I think the key here is to get, get a greater understanding of what the role, and there is a role, that whiskers play in um, our horses' uh, welfare and their health. So I think that's the key, not banning it. David. Thank you. David Mountford, British Horse Council. Um, in the days of... We're very good at bashing government, but Lord Gardner's announcement this morning that it's going to facilitate um, updating the central equine database is much appreciated by the industry. But on the welfare side of things, does Rowley think from general health and welfare that simplifying the registration on the central equine database and from Barry's perspective on the lifetime responsibility for the thoroughbred and able to, ability to trace it, that this announcement today will make a difference? I'd like to thank Lord Gardner. I think it will be transformational. Um, from one end of the scale, you can't call to people to account uh, for the way they're treating and caring for their animal unless you can prove their ownership. And so often in cases that we, the RSPCA, Red Wings and everyone else takes in, we can't prosecute them because we don't know who owns them. Now, we're not naive enough to think this is going to change overnight, but the first thing you need to do is have a system that's easy, easy to use. So I think it is transformational, but I also think we need to make sure that people understand the benefits benefits to the everyday horse owner uh, through actually uh, helping you if you lose or have your horse stolen, but also things like access to healthcare and a range of veterinary medicines. So I think there's a real communications job to get people to understand that actually, do you know, having a passport and having a central equine database is really good for my horse, as opposed to the somewhat cynical uh, view that most of us might have had up to now. <laughs> if I could add to that, that regulation for welfare is not a good thing. If people believe it's in their best interest and it's simple, they'll do it. And so I also am grateful for this change in the thing, that if we can make it simple for people to do and they do understand it and they do see it's in their best interest, they'll do it. Just passing a rule is almost a waste of time with horse owners, um, particularly when you go to places like Appleby. So having something that's simple, that works, and people appreciate it, then they'll use it. Right, we've got another question on Slido uh, from Lisa Ashton. What actionable advice do Rowley and Barry sh share to brave difficult conversations of polar beliefs, SLO, reach conflict, transformation, and future-proof our sport? I think, and Barry mentioned it, and I'm not sure if I'm going to hit the nail on the head here at all, but I don't believe uh, just because something's difficult to do, and I'm relating here to vets having conversations with their horses if their uh, horses are overweight and um, relating to actually welfare you know the right welfare choice can be to euthanize the, the the animal you know these are difficult conversations to have and I will go on record and say that, you know, with all the, the um, horrific coverage in Australia around the, the slaughterhouse and the, uh, and the thoroughbreds that came off the track there, the issue there, in, in our belief, isn't sending the, your, your animal to the slaughterhouse, because for some people that should be an option if that's what they want. The vast majority of people shouldn't do. But what was clearly outrageous there was the conditions. But I don't think you can just sweep those issues under the carpet. We need to justify to the public what we're doing and how we're doing it. And just because you don't like it doesn't mean you can ignore it. 
gentleman there, and then Jeanette, and then we'll pause for lunch. Uh, Nigel Oakley, the Suffolk War Society. Uh, this, this isn't really a question, but just a comment after the two speakers. Um, I keep and work Suffolk horses, both um, plough and, and cut the corn with them, and I couldn't agree more that you, sh you shouldn't be cruel to horse. In fact, if you're a cruel to horse that weighs over a ton, you're a pretty silly sort of chap, to be honest. <laughs> um, but horses are like people. They, they don't want to stand around all day. My horses, when they go to work, put their heads down and have the collar on. I don't have to put a leader on it to bring them up from the field. They'll follow me. I do, and have done in the past, deliveries for Green King Brewery. And, and the horse... They're not, they're not silly animals. They'll back themselves into the curb and chop the wheel so they take the load off themselves. They are, they are sensible animals. I don't think just working a horse is cruel. The, the Suffolk horse was bred particularly to work, and that is its function in life. My father said to me when I was a youngster to go out and sh hoe sugar beet, he said to me, there are two chairs will kill you, Nigel, an electric chair and an armchair. <laughs> 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 and, and I don't think that remark ever did me any harm, and I don't think working, working my Suffolk horses has done those a lot of harm. But thank you very much. I, I really appreciate your comments. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. I've got to say, it's, it's no wonder your Suffolk horses work if an electric chair's on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> Je Thanks, Nigel. Jeanette, yeah. That's all right. It's all right. Um, but I'm just, I'm just want to pick up something Rosie said earlier, and maybe just challenge the room and those watching on live stream who do ride, and just to challenge yourself to question: to what level is it appropriate for me to provide medical or clinical interventions to my horse to allow me to do the thing I want to do? So I think that's a personal question everyone needs to start thinking about before we as a sector try coming to conclusions. Is a Damalon sachet a day okay? Is injecting the hops every few weeks okay? What, what, what's the limit to us as horse riders to what we do to our horses to enable them to do what we want to do for our pleasure? And I think that's a... a a challenging question for all of us because that new medicines and inspections are improving all the time. Barry first, and then uh, the answer to that in every question is what is best for the horse? What is the best long-term interest? It may well be a Daniel on a day. Lots of horses, no problem. But that's always the question, and it's like euthanasia, any of these difficult conversations that vets have with owners on a daily basis. What is best for the horse, and are we treating it with respect? Really? Pergolide, Butte, name but a few, have transformed equine welfare, and there's no doubt about it, but I think you're absolutely right. You've got to challenge it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, that's what the horse-human partnership is all about. As horse owners, it's about our job to give them a good life and a good death. And I think the other thing I would say is that we need to invest more, and it's great to see that we're starting to do this collectively in quality of life. Very challenging issue in people, and our understanding of how we can measure and assess quality of life in equines is, I would say, still pretty rudimentary, but is certainly getting better. And I think that's the way we can really help owners challenge themselves is through me uh, measuring and, and having an assessment of their quality of life. So when that decision comes, you can feel more confident and not be so um, uh, liable to the um, chatter um, on the livery yard where sometimes euthanasia is the last thing to consider. Great. Thank you very much. That's been a really good session. So thank you very much, Rolly and Barry. Really good. Thank you.